Uh, but we will get into this show. This, uh, interesting for a lot of reasons. It aired on Thursday, August the 26th of 1999. So it was taped, uh, two days prior, but this was the first WWF show at Kemper Arena after Over the Edge. Oh, wow. Which happened earlier that spring. And clearly that was not mentioned on the show. Hmm. Though there was an Owen Hart sign in the crowd, I noticed. I think there was like an RIP Owen or something like that. And we started the show off. This was coming off of SummerSlam, which had aired uh, the prior Sunday, where it was a three-way in the main event with Steve Austin, Mankind, and Triple H, where Mankind won the title. And then the next night on Raw, Triple H beat Mankind to win the title. So this would have been Hunter's first appearance coming out with the title, ever. His first title win mm-hmm. with China at the time. So keeping in sync with our MTV True Life episode last week. So, you know, so memorable are, you know, the the post-championship victory appearances of so many guys. You know, you think about uh, Ric Flair after win- just winning the, the Royal Rumble and having cutting that promo. Um, you think about so many people coming out the first time that they've won a promo and – or sorry, won a championship and then cutting a, a, a really memorable promo. Promo championship. <laughs> I can't believe that didn't happen in 1999. <laughs> yeah. The best talker. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, um, appearing in what is supposed to be a very big moment. You know, you you've, this is a, really the culmination of your career, your a lifetime of achievement. It's that first championship promo. It's the first visual of this yeah. guy with the title presenting himself as the champion. Exactly. That uh, That is always something that um, I still find is really interesting when you're going with a new guy and it's that first title win. And so, you know, a guy like Triple H, um, you figure would maybe decide to dress for the occasion. Or not dress for the occasion. Just forget the shirt. He comes out here. Jeans. Wait, nope. what's wrong with jeans? <laughs> well, the jeans are fine. He but, would hardly be the worst dressed, even in this segment. Listen, jeans are fine. But jeans are not fine when you're not wearing anything on your body. This guy came out with no shirt, just jeans, and the title wrapped around his waist. I mean, you know, Triple H. I don't think. I mean, I don't. I don't know if if anybody would ever like cite him as one of the. He's a pretty decently dressed wrestler. This was kind of At this, this weird post DX Hunter kind of he in this he, badass heel role, but yep. not before he had like the flair influence with the suits. And this was out. yeah, like shortly after this, he would uh, you know kind of stumble upon that fake biker look that you know he he kind of right. grew to like with the with the the backwards what do you call that hat. Like the oh the beret, <laughs> I don't know if you call it a beret. That's but. what I'd call it. Man named Levesque, <laughs> Levesque was the beret. Anyway, his Samuel L. Jackson leather <laughs> cap. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also the um, the 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 t shirt cut out into the jean jacket vest. The jean jacket. He did vest. bring out the the chain vest later on in the show, which really? I believe predated uh, the Scott Steiner share. Headdress ensemble. I remember he had a leather jacket with the the jean jacket vest. Yes. The jean vest over top of that. How does this guy escape, like, the horrendous fe- – like, maybe it's because he's always been sh- in the shadow of Shawn Michaels, who, uh, to me, me, pound for pound, worst dressed main eventer maybe ever. <laughs> he's the worst. No, no. Shawn was fine. Like, I, Did like you see the his – uh, guest referee attire tonight. Yeah. And believe me, he'd come out in his favorite commissioner t-shirt and fucking suit jacket combo. Definitely post-retirement, Sean. Like, he, he's just... Once he's retired, he doesn't care. Like, Sean now, he just... He's just... He doesn't give a shit. Does not care Any man that'll walk out on a national television with the fucking boots <laughs> up to the knee-high boots rubber boots like that's a no fucks given attitude no shaving no uh, mcmillan adventures cap but at this point triple h i think you know was he definitely had a certain confidence about him but he was still very much i think trying to find his footing as a main eventer trying to trying to find his own identity um here he it just seemed like he was kind of relying on on a lot of cliches and even in his verbiage and this – the fall of 1999 was a, such an interesting period because it was clear they were getting behind Triple H and moving him into that main event heel role. And really, he did not take to that spot easily. 
Yep. That whole fall, it felt like a guy who was being overpushed and just shoved down people's throats. And there was a lot of rejection. And that's interesting because we've seen how many guys over the next 15 years after that who have been thrown into these spots. And it's just, oh, guy can't cut a promo. Guy can't work main event style. People aren't taking to him. Mm-hmm. And they stayed with Hunter. And they were, that was their guy. And the Mick Foley program later that next year in the 2000 that really started shifting people's perceptions of him. But the first couple of months were a fucking struggle. Like, here's a guy who loses the title, this title, to Vince McMahon. Yeah. So. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine if they gave up on Hunter? No, that, that would mean no Stephanie Angle, nothing. Like, he wouldn't have had anything. Imagine if he'd use Dolph Ziggler and just, he'd you know, be, eventually cut out. He'd be like Kevin Nash, maybe. I don't know about that. Why? If they'd way. given up on him, just like a, a failed champion who... I don't even know if he'd be Kevin Nash. He might just be... He might be He might be in TNA right now. God, he might be retired. He maybe. Might, might be signing autographs. Maybe Hunter would have married uh, Dixie. Um, I don't know. Maybe he'd still be with China. Maybe he would have been with China. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Who knows what would have happened there. Well, the show started off with this dramatic musical montage focusing on Triple H and The Rock featuring highlights of their main event strap match at Fully Loaded. Oh, well, there you there go. There were highlights of this main event strap match. Uh, then they go to SummerSlam winning the title on Raw Monday night. And he was able to get this title match on Raw after attacking Jim Ross. And they added this sound effect in post of a bone crunching as Triple H applied this arm bar onto Jim Ross. This was last the, a week ago? This was on the Monday on the before Monday. SmackDown. Oh, okay, wow. He, he's, uh, he recovers uh, quick. He put Jim on Ross. a hand wrap. <laughs> that was his Pretty extent. Put on some gel and magically healed. At least he had something on. Yeah. And getting assistance from Shane McMahon, who was the referee on the Monday, and Triple H beating Mankind to win his first title. And then we got some forgotten... Theme music, and that was the old SmackDown opening theme, which went uh, like something like, uh, <laughs> "You know, what are the lyrics?" I can't. There were no lyrics. I can't imagine anyone attaching vocals to this, but this felt like it was some little cartoon. Like, where, 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 where? That's the best I can do. It was just such a wacky theme song. Yeah. I, I, so much of the aesthetics of SmackDown, I thought, were done to deliberately distinguish itself from Raw. And that includes the music, where Raw... The color. Blue. Yeah, obviously the color, blue instead of red. You know, the, the Raw Titantron is a rectangular Titantron. Well, we're going to have an oval Titantron, which I guess looked kind of distinct, but I thought... I, I just as a, as a videographer, what a nightmare to, you know, crop... In an oval. Yeah, this probably would have been Kevin Dunn territory. I wonder what Vince Russo might have, who was still writing the show at this time. Who knows? What what his pitch is. Bro, we are going (sighs) to have the ring be backstage and they are going to walk out into the backstage, which will be in front of the crowd. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It will be the reverse entrance. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, all the writers will be... That was the birth of the uh, ideas of reverse blank, reverse blank in Vince Russo vernacular. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the color of the of the ropes, everything, including the music, where Raw had a very, you know, pretty pretty much like an aggressive metal type of theme. And this was more of, of like an electronic kind of... Yes, this would predate uh, the Marilyn Manson open. They had the beautiful people and then mm-hmm. they'd go through their, their various phases did, did you of like SmackDown the, themes. Did you like the set? Yeah, it was different enough that I think the key is that if you were to show a screenshot of Raw and a screenshot of SmackDown, you know which is which, right? There's still the ramp, still the visual uh, Titantron, I guess. Um, So it looked different enough, and I guess this was the Democratic show. Raw was Republican. Uh, Yeah, I suppose so. So Enough differences while still not compromising the the WWE look. Like, this felt like a WWE show. It's not like you were presenting uh, something radically different that you didn't know what it was. And I I don't think that was the intent of SmackDown. It was different but equal. Mm -hmm. So the show starts off. um, Announcers are Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler. And then Triple H and China come out. Hunter's voice sounds shot here, like he is about to lose his voice. He says, 
And I would have just two words for all of you. But tonight, I've got about four. Uh-oh. Sounds like they have two words for Triple H. That's one word, King. Oh, here Kansas City. Maybe so, but the fact of the matter is, I am the World Wrestling Federation Champion! I have four words for you. And the fans start chanting asshole. And his four words, very Greg from the peg-like, I am the World Wrestling Federation Champion. World Wrestling. You could even give him the, uh, the excuse of uh, making WWF an acronym, still not sizing it down to four I words. The, yeah. Wow. So what was he thinking? Not a great... Not a great mathematician at this point in time in his career. The Rock is showing, wa- is showing watching this in the backstage area. He brags about taking out Steve Austin, who had recently had to go for uh, knee surgery and thus not on this show and would not be on uh, TV for a couple of weeks. Beating Mankind refers to The Rock as the people's ass. And this prompts The Rock to come out, calls SmackDown the premier show, and says... That Triple H's game sucks and that he will beat him for the title tonight. Hunter comes back saying Rock isn't even in his league and tells him to get lost. Rock comes back saying he could go to the back, take off his $800 shirt and start this promo all over again. And then threatens to shove the title up a Hunter's ass. Hunter says you can't even hold my jock. Ugh. To which JR has to intervene. Very inflammatory remarks back and forth. God, this felt like the cliche 1999 opening segment promo from these two. Like, no substance back and forth. Just like witty words to get reactions from the crowd. Well, I'll say at the very least with with The Rock, I mean, he did it in his... It's it. It all seems cliche now because everybody, you know, has done a rock impression following this, you know. Um, but at the time, like this was all his creation. Like this was him. This was him doing it. Um, you know, at the time that it, it, this stuff came out, Hunter. For, in contrast, though, pal, you can't even hold my jock. Uh, that just it just makes you cringe when 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 you hear somebody say something like that. Why would you want to <laughs> hold someone's jock? Like, what would that accomplish? Like, I, I've got Wei Ting's jock, and I can balance it in my... Like, <laughs> is it supposed to say that, like, you can't even carry my balls, much less my own jock, which holds my balls? Like, what, what, is, what is the, I think the, they, the they, sword, no. the, the edge of the sword that's hitting somebody with that, that insult? The idea is that I, I suppose that your jock is so big because your your balls and and your dick are so big <laughs> that you can't even carry it because you, you know. Wouldn't the opposite be an even huge. worse insult? Like, you can go carry my jock. You're my jock carrier. Uh, the apparatus that supports my testicles. That's your job is to take care of that because it's such an important task. You piece of shit. Well, I it's mean, like when people call want, someone a worthless dude, would, piece of shit. Would, they gotta add. They gotta add worthless to it. I wouldn't touch anybody's uh, jock. You know, like you heard of jock itch. That stuff like spreads, man. You know, I wouldn't want to touch anybody's nasty. Uh, Especially to touch pro any- wrestlers. Yeah, I wouldn't want to touch anybody's. Anything. There's clearly no testing going on at this particular time period. Yeah, a lot of physiques on this show. Way, a lot of a lot of work being done. Nine to five in the gym. Um, So this continues until Rock walks down the aisle, takes off what he describes as a $600 shoe. So we've got $1,400 in clothing here for the man. It says he's going to turn this sideways and will stick it up Triple H's ass. A lot of uh, intrusion going on with the sphincter. And then out comes Commissioner Shawn Michaels in jeans. We had the jean team here. Should have sensed this alignment right at the beginning of the show. The Gene Machine. The Gene Machine. Shawn Michaels. Wearing a t-shirt and a white jacket. 
You know the Kurt Angle now in this commissioner role in TNA. He's been watching his Shawn Michaels tapes because that's what that's the Kurt Angle look now, where he puts on like a rash guard or a t-shirt, and he, it's just this idea. You can put a sports coat over anything, and it, it and it looks classy. No, it doesn't. Yeah, you're a senior now. Jacket. <laughs> oh, you look official. Yeah. So Sean is out, and I guess doing his sporadic appearance here at the time. And makes the title match for the main event and has announced he will be the guest referee tonight. So Triple H will defend the title on the first SmackDown episode. But then Shane McMahon enters the ring to a chorus of boos. Says that Shawn Michaels does have stroke to make the match. But as owner of the company, he is going to make himself the second special referee in the main event. And at this time, uh, The Undertaker had lost to Steve Austin in... I guess the dark match at Fully Loaded following the main event. And Vince McMahon had to leave television forever. And forever was still going on at this point before he would make his return. So Shane was the the key authority figure at this point, working with Triple H. Michaels then gives Shane a lesson in stroke and announces that Shane will have a match coming off of his four-star performance at SummerSlam and makes a match between Shane McMahon and Mankind for later on in the show. Does the segment end here? No. Because out comes Mankind, who brings up stroking and screwing that's got him all excited. And then goes on to say, Why put off until today what we can do tomorrow? That Ross and Lawler were both confused by. He mocked the Rock's promo, walks down to the ring, and then... Gets into the ring. Everyone starts fighting. The Mean Street Posse come out to help. The baby faces lay them out. A pair of rock bottoms are hit. And that concludes this opening lengthy, lengthy segment to kick off the new SmackDown era in WWF programming. This was like a 17-minute segment. This was really goddamn long. (laughs) In a two-hour show, not a three-hour show even. So... You know, it was long, but it was just kind of very typical of, you know, the style that we still see today. You Just a long talking segment where... They people, want to get all the stars out right off the top. All the stars and just to set up, a, you know, that night's card. It was, it was okay. This is where we cut to Jim Ross and Lawler, where Ross had his, his hand taped up. But, you know, completely, you know, we didn't get one of those championship promos from Triple H. We got nothing like that. No, this really didn't have the feeling of, you know, a new kind of era in the company. Here, here we are coming off this injury to Steve Austin where he's now off television for for a little bit of time anyway. And, you know, Triple H was not designed to just be some transitional champion that's going to hold the belt for two weeks. I mean, he was clearly a guy they were getting behind. And you certainly didn't have the feeling that this is our... A1, number one heel. It would take quite a while for him to get to that spot. Nor did you have Mick Foley, who just recently lost the title, last we saw, looking looking upset at all. He comes out here cracking jokes, talking about... He's got got over it. Yeah. As John Cena so infamously said, titles come and titles go. Yeah. They tee up the matches on the show, then they show Jarrett with Deborah and Miss Kitty in the back, as well as Billy Gunn. And that will set up our first match. The first match in SmackDown history. Wait, what a trivia question this is. Jeff Jarrett taking on Billy Gunn, non-title match. Well, you must have had a, a longer version than I did. I watched the six-part version on YouTube. Yeah, that's what I watched. Was this I, not there? No, I didn't get it. Oh, you know what? I started watching this on the WWE Network. Oh, okay. So I guess this match got cut out. I didn't realize it was a longer version. What's the first match you saw? Um, The triple threat tag. Okay. Kane. Okay, well, maybe it's only this match they took out. I'll quickly run okay, through it. Okay, sure. Um, Jarrett, uh, this match got set up when Jarrett hit China with a guitar shot on Raw, and then Billy Gunn came out and hit a chair shot to Jarrett right afterwards. If for no other reason, we got Billy Gunn coming out to his illustrious ass man theme, where he would come out, turn around a la Dolph Ziggler, and start shaking his ass, because he is the ass man. Well, you can't shake anything else but your ass if you come with that song. Billy Gunn just hit this horrendous drop kick, which was identified as a great drop kick. They really love to push Billy Gunn. Remember, he won the King of the Ring just a few months before this, Mm -hmm. and is coming off... 
SummerSlam, where he lost a kiss-my-ass match to The Rock, where he was a heel in that match, but must have morphed on Raw into a babyface, because that's how he was presented here, coming to China's aid. So I guess moving on from having to kiss this large woman's ass on the pay-per-view. But, but China is a heel. Oh, that's... Yeah, this was the weird part, because China was the heel with Hunter, but had now started feuding with Jarrett, who was a heel, and with Jarrett hitting China with the guitar, it was kind of like Triple H, uh, China was playing both roles. Right. Like, she was the sympathetic victim here who got attacked by Jarrett, and Billy Gunn came to her save. <laughs> it was very bizarre. Um Debra gets on the apron to try and distract Billy Gunn, but just gives up when that doesn't work. Billy Gunn missed a forearm splash or smash and flew to the floor, got sent into the post. And then there was a chant of, we want puppies. Gunn drops Jarrett face first on the top turnbuckle. And then China comes down to ringside, grabs the guitar and breaks it over Debra's back as she's trying to go uh, for Miss Kitty. And then Gunn, with the distraction, rolls up Jeff Jarrett and pins him in two minutes, 55 seconds. After the match, China is arguing with Billy Gunn, and Billy Gunn turns around and goes to moon her. But before he can pull his pants down, China gets on both knees and low blows Billy Gunn. Good. Yes, so beat him to the punch. Yeah. Lillian Garcia is with Al Snow in the back, and there is a report that the big boss man will show up later tonight with Pepper. The dog, which Big Boss Man has kidnapped, and Al Snow pleads for the Big Boss Man not to hurt Pepper. He will do anything. And then they show Howard Finkel polishing Chris Jericho's boots in preparation for Chris Jericho's WWF debut coming up later tonight on SmackDown. Then they show Test backstage awaiting Stephanie McMahon after he proposed to her on Raw Monday night. And then we go to the triple threat tag match for the tag titles with The Undertaker and Big Show defending the tag titles with Paul Bear in their corner against the teams of The Acolytes and X-Pac and Kane. What is most amazing is that Kane, Big Show, and Bradshaw all still staples of Raw 15 years later. That is incredible. I guess if you're a big man, you'll always have Or work. transition to the announce desk. Yep. Imagine if things went differently and The Undertaker had just taken off as a color commentator after this match. <laughs> this was the funniest part. It was just The Undertaker on commentary. Well, wait, we're, wait we're being joined by The Undertaker. Oh, what a pleasure. Of course, it's a pleasure. Well, I'm a little bit surprised, sir. At your, your tag team title's on the line and you're not there. You're here. I mean, obviously. What you're getting ready to witness, Jim Ross, is a case of what you might call hard love. But this is the way I teach. So what you have the benefit of is my color commentary. Like, he's just like a normal dude here. Like, yeah. the, the badass. It really didn't suit him. I mean... This was pre-American badass, but really not the satanic character, even though that was the look he still had. The Undertaker has always kind of maintained a mystique as somebody who didn't really speak very much. But when he did, he almost spoke in, like, a godlike manner. And here, it was just odd because he can't, comes out and basically plays the same color commentary role that we see so many people try to do these days on raw and you know just kind of fail like he he, he it was like he was a um, aj here or something Imagine if he had to start like plugging shit if he became a regular color commentary could you imagine him plugging uh the 999 yeah Anyway, it's a character, especially this, you know, the dead man character. The more he speaks, the more he gets exposed. And I just didn't think this – this feud was weird too. I don't I don't remember this team at all between the Big Show and, and the Undertaker. This was like one of the weirdest pairings because I think it was really based in reality where Big Show came into the company and they thought they had gotten the next Andre the Giant. And I mean it was it – was, Big Show will admit like when he started in 95 – he had really no training. He was learning how to wrestle in WCW. He was way behind the, the curve of all these main event guys he's working with. And then he comes to the WWF where he's working with Austin, Rock, Taker, and he was floundering here. And the idea was pair him with The Undertaker who's going to try and mentor this guy. And this became like the legit storyline here at the time was that Big Show is learning from The Undertaker – in this tag team, it's the teacher and student with Taker on commentary for this match saying he's teaching Big Show tough love, 
by sending him in there to defend the tag titles by himself against these two other teams. Mm-hmm. I, I think a, a storyline like that would be fine for anybody but The Undertaker. I don't know. It just uh, – how, how do you go – and this is after the corporate ministry. So how do you go from leading a, a band of, I don't know, your own cult? To Sacrificing dudes to uh, imparting wisdom. To being the big show's mentor. The bigger, the bigger picture yeah. for the big show. The other thing I loved about this, even before we get to, to the match, uh, x pac comes out. Drinking his Hanson's energy drink. Is that what it was? Yeah. Hanson's energy drink. I mean... I remember there was, like, this time where, yeah, he came out constantly with his energy drink. Like, they got this product placement he was a, He was a spokesperson. The, the idea that X-Pac at one time was a spokesperson for any kind of product is unimaginable today. And so awkward, too. Like, he's coming out... And it's like they just inserted this can. Like he's just coming out, doing his weird gyrations, <laughs> yeah. and, but holding an energy drink. I got all this energy from this energy drink. But he doesn't even drink it. He just, like sit, puts it in his mouth and he spits it out. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like it would be the worst character to try and get across a a drink being – tasty and worth buying is the dude who spits yeah. shit out and can't digest it uh, this this drink is great for rinsing with man it's too bad they could have gotten like red bull before it really exploded i mean hansen's energy drink not really standing the test of time in, in the energy drink market no not really Maybe some early science or yeah whatever was out there sure but red bull is probably a big thing in, in pro wrestling i'd imagine in the world really they could have gotten a deal with uh, El Torito. Yes. So the match begins. There was a sign in the crowd that just stated matter-of-factly, fire, viscera, and Midian. <laughs> that's, that's mean. Not fans. Yeah. Kane hit a DDT to Big Show. Bradshaw made the save. Everyone was just fighting in the ring. Says that the title, the tag titles, are the first step in the major plan that The Undertaker has. He's got a major plan, plans that would never come to fruition. Starting with a tag team title? Yeah, that was just the first step way to... you could skip that one. Big Show gets sent to the floor. Taker gets upset and starts yelling at him, including the, the natural question that you would say in the heat of battle to another man. Do you want to be a killer? And Big Show said yes. And then slaps the Big Show. He goes to powerbomb X-Pac, but APA takes out the legs of the Big Show. Lawler then asks if Big Show, he just said this like so calmly, he asks The Undertaker if Big Show will be stabbed if he loses this match. What? Will he be stabbed? Because that was what they did to Midian once. They stabbed him. Oh, okay. They were going to sacrifice him. Uh, Undertaker was non-committal with his answer. Kane made the hot tag, hit a clothesline off the top, and this place went... Fucking ape shit for Kane, hitting a oh, top yeah. rope clothesline. Then chokeslam Farouk. They double-team Big Show. And then Kane drop kicks Bradshaw from the ring, but turns around into a choke slam, and Big Show pins Kane at 3 minutes and 46 seconds. A combination we could see on Raw next Monday, for all we know. Big Show and Kane. Mm-hmm. But in 1999, uh, Big Show had long hair. That was the main difference and kane had a mask kane had long hair too he had yeah he had long hair which we later learned was just uh just part of the mask oh wow um what what a triple threat tag (laughs) this was the epitome of wwf 1999 television matches yeah um i mean uh my expectations were not to expect any high quality matches on on this show and it it really just it was more storyline first than if you were a big wwf fan in 1999 in ring was not necessarily what was bringing you back no. week after week. It was characters, storylines, promos, star power, and way more matches like this than, you know, your three star main event you'd get on a pay per view. Like the work level in 1999, just even a year later in 2000, night and day. Yeah. Test is still pacing in the back. Stephanie really needs a cell phone. Just waiting and waiting and waiting. And then Stephanie shows up smiling and she's made a decision but just keeps on walking. And Tess just has this like little shitty and grin. God, was this funny stuff at the time. 
Big Boss Man comes out, speaking of funny stuff, and calls out Al Snow. And he says that Pepper is safe for now, but that anything can happen. And never has a description been more appropriate than for what would eventually happen with poor Pepper. Anything did happen. E- everything happened. Yeah. Says he warns Al that if that son of a bitch bites him one more time, Pepper is going straight to hell. Ooh. Do they have dogs in hell? Um, I don't know. Dogs go to heaven. <laughs> That's right? right. All dogs go to heaven. Yeah. He says he wants a hardcore title match, which is the title Al Snow possesses, and in exchange, he will give him back the dog, win or lose. You understand me? That dog's safe. He's safe for now. <laughs> but anything can happen. Everybody knows I'm not a patient man. But one thing's for sure. If that little SOB bites me again, I'm going to send him straight to hell. Look, 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 look. I'm sure he didn't mean it. I'm sure he was just scared. He misses me. Please just quit your whining. Quit your crying. If you want to see that mud again, what you're going to do is go to the back, get that hardcore belt, and you're going to bring it out here. I'm going to go get that damn dog. You understand me? The hardcore belt's going to be on the line. Win, lose, or draw, you get your dog back. I get my shot. That's the deal. Just whatever. Just don't hurt the dog. Whatever you want, I'll do whatever you want. Anything you want, just give me the, give me my friend back, please. Hey, you're right. You're going to do anything I want. So don't let nothing happen to you between now and the time you get in this ring. Because if you don't show up, I'm dead serious about this. I'm going to take that dog, that mud of yours, that rat, to a cold, dark place and show him what hard times is all about. Or, if he doesn't give him the match, he will take the dog to a cold, dark place and show him what hard times is all about. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. I will take the dog to oh, a cold, man. dark place and show him what hard times is all about. Oh, boy. So That's a little... Uh, maybe he was going to sell him to Michael Vick. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know, but animal cruelty, full front and center here in this listen, big boss man Al Snow program. This angle is so ridiculous that I have no, I can't evoke any type of emotion or any type of reaction to it. But I will say, big boss man. I thought he was great very, promo. He's very good at it, dude. I hated the big boss man at this time. But I go back and watch him. This dude's a better promo than like half the guys that talk on Raw today. He came across like a legit, you know, scary, tough guy who felt like he was... It's going, like a piece of shit. He like was, that was his gimmick. He, you are a fucking worthless human being. Yeah, who attacks dogs. Steals dogs and takes steals, them to dark places. Steals, yeah. And might cook them. Yes. By the way, boss man... First to wear the slot vest, looking like a, an original member of the Shield here. Oh, wow. Maybe that was an ode to Big Boss Man, the man who proudly wore the Shield as the Big Boss Man. And the Shield, the, paying tribute. The first Shield member. The very first member the of the Boss Shield, man. Ray Trailer. Yeah. So we had Al Snow and, oh, before this way, they plugged the upcoming Unforgiven pay-per-view which was unforgettable if you were a big boss man Al Snow fan. But the presenting sponsor of Unforgiven, Magic the Gathering. Whoa! Magic card sponsored Damn. Unforgiven. <laughs> when I think of that, it used to be when I remembered Unforgiven 1999, it was the kennel from hell, the one of the most infamous disasters in company history. But now when I think of Unforgiven, that is the show where we had to do the review three times. Wow. Is that right? We fucked we up watched, two times. We talked about that match three times? Three separate podcasts to do that Unforgiven 99. Oh, my. And I was nearly going to take myself to a dark place as a result of that three-time review. Um, do you remember anything else on that show beyond I, the I, Kennel from Hell? I don't even remember that. I, I, <laughs> I was watching the show. You've got to remember Kennel from Hell, though. No. I was watching the show wondering if we had even reviewed it. I think I'm, I think I just like forget everything. Maybe that's the answer. You're always worried about us running out of stuff. We'll, 
We'll just review stuff again, and it'll. Be, I yeah. think I could get away with doing that one week and not even telling you we've reviewed it. Yeah, already. You, you should try it one week and just uh, you know, hey, hey wait, we're, next week we're going to review uh, uh, SmackDown from uh, August twenty sixth, nineteen ninety nine. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. And then when I ask you off the top, do you remember watching this at the time? You're like, yeah, I did watch this back when it debuted. No, I won't. You'll just that. confuse viewing time. Sometimes, by like, years. I mean, I'd save all my notes for that reason. Thinking that maybe someday we'll actually go back and to, and and review some of these things. And I do won't. you do you save any of your okay when you take notes for Raw three hour Raw? Yeah. How many pages do you usually write? Do you remember? Uh, it's not really pages. It's just like one long document. Okay, because yeah. I for whatever reason I don't save our review notes, but I do save my Raw notes just for whatever reason. And I typically it's like four pages in Microsoft Word for a three hour Raw. I hit the same what, amount. What, what size font? Like size 11. Okay. So I had the same amount of notes for this two-hour SmackDown as I did for a three-hour Raw. No, so that tells wow. you how much stuff happened on SmackDown. Like there were the same amount of segments, but the amount of scenes yeah. and cuts, it was w- like such a faster pace show you, than Raw. You get much more wrestling now. Way more wrestling now, but yeah. – Way more different scenes yeah. and backstage stuff during the SmackDown. Like so much happened on this show. Maybe you could argue too much. I'd like to know, you know, if if that holds true for their scripts and their rundowns too. Oh, I bet they do. I've seen 1999 scripts, and they're a fraction of the length because the promos aren't written out at this time. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so Al Snow and Boss Man, hardcore title. Al Snow defending. Big show. Uh, big show. Big Boss Man brought Pepper out. Had a muzzle on him. Mm-hmm. And they showed these close-ups because he hands it to Jerry Lawler. And they show a close-up of Pepper with this muzzle. This is a real dog, and it's shaking. Yeah. I was – I thought this was horrible. <laughs> like this poor little dog is in the middle of this horrible angle, doesn't know where it is, <laughs> and it's shaking. Yeah, the worst is that it's – And allegedly pees on Jerry Lawler like in fear. Of what it's involved with here. Well, that was obviously, I think the, the worst part of it was the fact that this angle sucks so much. If it was a good angle, then the dog had something to be proud of. No, there was nothing for Pepper to be proud about in this particular angle. Uh, but I, I was like, I could see today there being like outrage over like a dog being used like this in an angle. Like just the muzzle and the sh- close up of it shaking was just, it was kind of disturbing for me. Right. But, I mean, dogs, you know, why, why is it okay for, uh, let's say, a, a Rottweiler or a, a pit bull to be muzzled? I think but there's not, a... not a chihuahua. Well, I just... It looked like this... It just had this feeling of an animal that was very much against its will here, being just put into this bizarre scenario. I don't know. It's just very strange. Yeah. Right. So the match begins. Uh, big, big Boss Man just beats up on Snow. He pulls out a ladder... Al Snow stops him from using it, and Snow then attacks him with a cookie sheet, just like your 1999 like check marks for everything, cookie sheets, ladders. Boss Man then knocks him off the top to the floor, and a ladder is used and sent into the face of the Boss Man from the floor. Snow goes for Pepper, but this allows Big Boss Man to hit him with a nightstick, and hardcore matches can end anywhere, so Snow gets pinned on the floor in 2 minutes and 20 seconds, and we get a title change. The big boss man wins the hardcore title and then goes against his word and takes Pepper with him. He said win or lose, he would give back Pepper and instead takes the title and takes Pepper. He took a risk, you know? Like if Al Snow had won, then I think he probably would have left with the dog. Would have lost his leverage over Al if he didn't have Pepper. So another meaningless hardcore title switch, it, it just... No no creativity even put into this finish. He just hit him with a nightstick and covered him. That's now, it. this did predate the whole 24-7 rule where you would get like eight title changes per show. Uh, but I think part of the reasoning here was to, I mean, the hardcore title meant nothing. But I think it was the idea that maybe you'll see a title change in the main event. What? What do you mean? I think the idea that SmackDown right off the gate is a show that <sighs> you might see. A title change oh, on. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, I'm just saying. They didn't, I know I know what you're saying, but I mean, I, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't really think about that. 
This is the, the hardcore title. This was this was a very very valuable asset in the company way. Yeah, it held prestige. X Pac is in the back. He tells Kane it was he, totally secondary to this dog. The dog was the real title. Maybe that's what he won. Yeah, maybe. Maybe Pepper. The fact Pepper didn't change hands. No. X Pac tells Kane in the back he's sick of being the weak link, and this led to Kane moaning, "Sean." This is serious now. He's not X-Pac Sean. backstage. Jericho is walking in the back and says he is here to save the show tonight. And then Snow is... We cut back to the ringside where he discovers Pepper is gone and runs to the back. After the break, he is searching for Big Boss Man in the back. And they say the Boss Man has left the building. Road Dog and Chris Jericho in Chris Jericho's first match in the WWF. Historic moment. Jericho had been aligned with Howard Finkel here at the start of his run, and he had used Howard as a distraction to attack the Road Dog on Raw Monday night. And Road Dog cuts a promo in the ring saying that Chris Jericho, he would not be able to sell Jericho's ass for a pack of cigarettes in jail, but he doesn't want to sell his ass. He wants to whip his ass tonight. Do you got all that? Who wrote this? Probably Road Dog. I don't want to sell it. I want to whip it. Okay. He's not going to prostitute Chris Jericho on this particular night. Jericho comes in. Match begins. Road Dog immediately points to his dick. And then Jericho clotheslines him over the top to the floor. Road Dog gets thrown into the steps, and this would lead to Road Dog selling his lower back throughout the match. Jericho gets crotched on the top rope. So what does Road Dog with his bad back do? Superplex off the top. Finkel then gets onto the apron and throws some kind of drink at the Road Dog. I don't think this was Hanson's energy drink. This was another substance. He throws it, but it was it had no effect. No, he at all. sold it. Like what was the point of that? Maybe it was um I don't know. Okay. Jericho gets the advantage back. Hits a double underhook into a backbreaker and then brings a table into the ring. Road Dog blocks a suplex onto the table, turns into a DDT, hits the shake, rattle, and knee drop. He continues selling the lower back. Jericho comes back, power bombs Road Dog, and then lifts him up for a second time, dropping him through the table, which resulted in a DQ at 4 minutes and 30 seconds. And then applied the Walls of Jericho, which was much more the Lion Tamer version, but this was before it had its name. So on the first time that the walls got executed, it was identified as, quote, some kind of modified Boston Crab with some extra added pressure by Jerry Lawler. I think that would have made for a hell of a T-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> some kind of modified bro- Boston Crab with some extra added pressure. <laughs> and uh, that would end uh, this particular segment. For a long time, Jericho, when he debuted in the WWF, uh, was using that double power bomb, And it was always, from the get-go, very awkward because he was simply too small to execute it on a lot of guys. Um, and here, I just found it so funny that I recall the first time he tried it, I believe on Road Dog, it was like he tried three and really struggled. It's always been awkward. Even like when a guy like uh, when Brock debuted, he, he had he it too. He would do that. And even then it was weird if it was on anybody else but like Spike Dudley. But anyway, I, I found this finish kind of weird because uh, here t- uh, Tim White DQs Jericho for power bombing Road Dog through a table. So what the fuck? What do you expect when you have a, a giant table sitting in the middle of the ring? You know? How, 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 do, how do you expect a guy to not Maybe to sit it? down after the match and go over their differences. Come to some mutual resolution. Yeah. Move on from the feud. It's funny because when Chris Jericho came in, I mean, that first night with The Rock, you really felt like this guy was being brought in as a top heel. Mm-hmm. And here we are by his first match. Like, goofy undercard heel. Like, he had so much just comedy thrown into him. Yep. And it was like already established kind of his placement at See, the beginning. But I mean, it was in WCW where he kind of like, he kind of made that reputation for himself, right? He was always a bit of a comedy guy. 
mid card comedy guy. But I know what you're saying. Like he kind of came in with a, with kind of higher expectations, and you'd figure they'd start him off a little higher on, uh, on the card. But no, they started him pretty much like you know from like the low mid card. Then Jericho is in the back with Howard Finkel, and he calls this company ridiculous, and he talks about how dominant Howard can be, and they start mocking Tony Chimmel, who has replaced Howard Finkel as the ring announcer in the WWF. He tells Finkel that he is better than Chimmel and says, you are a warrior, Howard, and you should go out there and prove you are a machine. And Chimmel goes to introduce the next match, but then... The Ultimate Warriors theme music hits and out races Howard Finkel to the Warriors theme. And he poses in the corner. He shakes the ropes and yells at Chimmel, I am the best at what I do. Says he wants his job back and shoves Tony and goes to introduce the next match when Tony Chimmel jumps Finkel from behind and beats the shit out of poor Fink and reclaims his ring and his microphone. Boy, where they just had it out for Howard Finkel. Like, just the butt of their jokes at this point. What, what does a Tony, Tony Chimmel do now? He's still a ring announcer for them. For what brand? Isn't he on SmackDown? Well, I thought it was Lily. I couldn't even tell you. It's Justin Robertson. It's Lily. Oh, you're right. You're right. I think, I mean, he oversees, like, a lot of the, uh, the ring crew. Mm-hmm. He's on the road with them. I couldn't tell you. I, I, I thought he showed some good fire here in his attack of Howard Finkel. I'm sure we got a singles match between these two, probably on a SmackDown, having yeah. not seen the early episodes. Hmm. But some great stuff here. Yeah. Jericho then comes out, and he asks Howard what's wrong with him. He's chastising him. And then Ken Shamrock comes down the ramp and shoulder bumps Jericho and then sends Finkel after him. And Shamrock tries to break Howard's hand, and this allows Jericho to run around the ring, get a chair, and hit Shamrock from behind with a chair, and then spit on him. And then Shamrock chases them to the back. Ken Shamrock. Holy shit. Oh, yeah. Look at this dude. Uh, (laughs) This is a man who has advocated for steroids being okay in MMA. (laughs) That's all I'm saying. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, got him a job, multiple places. Like, he looked insane here. Mm -hmm. Like, I thought Hunter looked pretty jacked in the opening segment, but Ken had him beat, hands down. Then our next segment, Stephanie comes out. She had been asked for her hand in marriage by a common wrestler, Jerry Lawler says. So Stephanie asks Andrew to come out, and Jim Ross informs us who that is. And out comes Andrew in leather pants. Jeans or leather pants, Way? Well, leather pants are part of his gimmick. That's like what that's what he always wore. What what kind of what kind of pants would you would you think would be appropriate? We're just gonna we're for for, uh, to propose to your girlfriend. Yeah, what pants did you wear when you proposed? I wore leather jeans, actually. (laughs) Oh yeah, Yeah. no shirt, no shirt, no shirt. (laughs) And I, uh, I had my hair all combed out. And uh, Stephanie, who I think we can largely say a good promo in 2014. Yeah, largely. absolutely. You know, she's, she's not uh, going to win best on the microphone any year. But nonetheless, very, I, I would say she, she at least she's very, a very good heel yeah. and a very good talker. Mm-hmm. This point, though, where Stephanie comes out looking so young. I like the transformation is so drastic between, you know, her heel persona and this that I wonder if it was intended uh, from the get go. What I mean by that is, you know, um, just cer- certain things about Stephanie that we've kind of accepted about her, you know, at least the hair. The c- I think mainly the confidence is, is, is the biggest thing. Not to say she wasn't confident here, but at least in the way this woman had never been on TV before. Well, like, le- th- this was, you know, prior to 1999. I mean, yeah. I mean, her intonation, her tone, her, the voice, everything about her is so different at this point in her career. The lack of makeup on her face at this point, straight hair, very kind of like girl next door type of look. Uh, and, you know, just immediately all transformed once she became a heel. She said to Andrew, 
quote, Last, this Monday night, you asked me a question. Mm -hmm. She, She says she has an answer, but Andrew wants to do this the right way. So he gets on one knee and proposes to her. And she says yes. And Jim Ross, there have been some great calls in the man's career. I don't know of any quite top. Yeah, yeah, at a girl. <laughs> Selling a marriage acceptance. Mm-hmm. This was great. And before they can celebrate their decision to come together in unity for the rest of their lives, the Mean Street Posse storm the ring and attack test as Shane holds Stephanie at bay. And this leads to mankind running in with a chair, blast the Mean Street Posse. This was significant because I now have a favorite member of the Mean Street Posse. Oh, who's that? Joey Abs, the Ooh. only member, got his hand up for this chair shot. The other two <laughs> took it right on the skull. Uh. Joey Abs has my admiration. <laughs> a man ahead of his time. Mm-hmm. Mankind gets on the microphone, says he is having his match with Shane right now because he is not walking up that ramp and having to come out one more time tonight. Good. The greatest justification for an impromptu match. And he tells Shane he's going to put this chair down and allow Shane to give him one shot with the chair to start the match. (laughs) Shane takes him up on the offer and blasts him from behind with this chair. As he's calling himself the king of hardcore, Mankind stands up, attacks Shane. We never got a bell, but the match was uh, just began, I guess. They fought uh, ringside. They crash into the desk where we see Test just laid out on the floor, just out from this Mean Street Posse attack. Uh, They fight into the crowd. There's a suplex over the barricade to the mat by ringside. In the ring, the Posse take... Uh, Mankind down to the floor. Tess gets back up to attack them. Crowd is into all of this. Patterson and Briscoe run down to fight off the Mean Street Posse. Stephanie is even choking Pete Gas. Then Mankind hits a double arm DDT to Shane. Calls for Socko. Applies it. Then China runs down to distract Earl Hebner. And this leads to Triple H running down. Hitting Mankind with a chair shot behind Hebner's back. And Shane McMahon gets the pinfall on Mankind. Quite yeah. the fall from WWF champion on Sunday to laying down for Shane on Thursday. Mm. Bad uh, week for Mick Foley. Yeah. A lot of just, uh, a not lot even of, a match, really. No, just a lot of booking, a lot of overbooking. But this is the style of show. This is pretty much what they wanted. Jericho is then in the back where he's in his car and drives off as Howard Finkel is left behind. Gets out of the parking lot just as Ken Shamrock shows up. And then he grabs Howard Finkel, yelling like a maniac, and says, What's that smell? And Howard Finkel shit his pants. Uh, Yeah, what was that line from, uh, what is it, uh, No Holds Barred? (laughs) I dookied? Yeah, dookie. Dookie. (laughs) Fuck. Sometimes wrestling sucks. This was one of those occasions. Al Snow is outside looking for Pepper, still. (laughs) And then we see Test and Stephanie in the back, and they get congratulated by Michael Cole, Earl Hebner, and Jimmy Corderas. Oh, wow. They were so happy. Did you not see this? Uh, Jimmy Corderas got some words in on SmackDown. Right. Trivia note. And then Shawn Michaels comes in his ridiculous shorts, his low-cut spandex shorts with a shirt that is tied off at the bottom that promoted his Shawn Michaels Wrestling Academy on the back, 1932 train, which the very next year is where a young Brian Danielson would show up. Mm-hmm. So we had our main event, Triple H and The Rock for the WWF title with Shawn Michaels and Shane McMahon as referees. Hunter out in his chain mesh t-shirt. Rock teases a rock bottom right away. It's blocked. Hunter tries for the pedigree. It's blocked and countered with a back body drop. Hunter cuts him off with a clothesline. China cheap shots The Rock from the floor. They fight up the ramp. Rock suplexes him onto the... to the steel floor. He hits a side rush and leg sweep to Hunter onto the steel. 
They return to the ring. They're fighting by ringside. China then hits a low blow to stop The Rock, and this leads to Shawn Michaels ejecting China from ringside. Triple H protests to Shawn. And then Hunter gets back into the ring. Rock hits him with a DDT. But Michaels is with China and has to run back and makes the two count. Shane then comes down to ringside. And Triple H has the heat at this moment. Rock makes a comeback. Drops Hunter on the top rope. And Shane is distracting Hunter. And then Rock knocks Shane off the apron. Hits a rock bottom to a huge reaction. And then sets up for the people's elbow. And he bounces off of one side of the ropes. And then comes off the second. And... Shawn Michaels super kicks The Rock like the perfect timing. Just hit this out of nowhere, and Hunter pedigrees The Rock, pins him in 9 minutes and 42 seconds, which might as well have been a 60-minute Broadway at 1999 level. And then Hunter, Shawn Michaels, Shane, and China all celebrate together, including Michaels and China hugging. It was all a plan, and JR was disgusted at this conspiracy by the now heel commissioner Shawn Michaels right and uh, what happened after this with Shawn nothing yeah nothing because like did they work any type of a- association or like how how long was Shawn even around after this how, when, when, when very was sporadic over? appearances yeah. I mean he kind of came and went for the odd time when they needed somebody it would play in somewhat to the next year at the Judgment Day pay-per-view they did Hunter and Rock in an Iron Man match and and Michaels was made the referee again, and they kind of played off of what happened this? the last time. Oh, really? That he was okay. a year ago, a year after that, oh, yeah, like a year, you know, that. eight months or whatever it was. Wow! So there you go. That was the first episode of SmackDown, where you went off the air thinking, "Oh my God, Michaels is coming back to face The Rock," but would not happen. No, just kind of an idea for the night, and then really nothing went anywhere with it. You know, I enjoyed this episode as sort of a look back at that, you know, at that period and uh, all these little to see Steph kind of uh, in her young self and all this other stuff. But um, not a very memorable first episode, I have to say. Do you think the 15th anniversary of SmackDown this week will be any more memorable than the first episode? Not at all. (laughs) Probably not. All right. Well, I give this show a... uh I give it a 3 out of 10. I really took very little from this show. There wasn't a whole lot of... I, I mean, I'm fine with, like, a small amount of wrestling if the other stuff to compensate it's just is another TV show. really entertaining. But it's, like, no real great angles, no no really memorable promos. Um, there was really very little to talk about or, or really glean from this episode of SmackDown. I mean, it was important in the sense this was a big shift for the WWF, adding two more hours of original programming. They certainly... I mean, this was on network television as opposed to cable for Raw, so they really valued this as being a huge deal. This was the first time there was going to be weekly wrestling on network television since the 50s. What had more viewers, more eyeballs? This At this point, Raw had more weekly viewers, but that would later change when Raw would still have the higher rating, but... But that's on a different scale. It was on a different scale because UPN was in more homes. So even though SmackDown would have the lower rating, they'd have the more overall viewers right. uh, for, for a period of time. More, And that was where SmackDown was certainly on par with Raw, if not ahead of it. Hmm. All right. Well, what do you give this show? Uh, four out of ten. Four. Yeah. Not, uh, nothing tremendous on this show. Let's see what you folks said. Uh, Matt from Suburban Detroit. JR and King and no fist. So far, SmackDown is getting a couple of points off. Triple H doesn't know how to count his words and then had a bad promo involving The Rock and HBK and a bunch of waste. More points off. China and Double J's program started this night. This can't get worse. Spoke too soon. Big Boss Man's Pepper program and Kennel from Hell are put into motion. Where's the saving grace? X-Pac thinks he's in the APA and Big Show's league. How'd this show survive to the Paul Heyman era? The only bright spot was Chris Jericho and Harold. Yes, a Ralphus retread, but still funny. And Jericho debuting the multiple powerbomb finish in early WWF run was amazing. Three ultimate Heralds out of ten. We go to Cataclysmic from Auckland. This was a great nostalgia episode for me, especially after seeing the old SmackDown opening again. I love when triple threat tag matches of three guys in the ring and not just two guys, where anyone can tag anyone like they do nowadays. That guitar shot on Deborah looked brutal, 
Imagine if WWE did that in the year 2014. Same with the Pepper Angle. How times have changed. Howard Finkel was one of the only highlights on this episode. I particularly love Jericho's line about Chimmel not having the hair Finkel does. A pretty average main event, although it was much better than the crap we get now. I give this episode 6 Wade Keller lies signs out of 10. We go to David Duffenberg. For the first couple of years... On, of SmackDown, I was never able to watch it. My cable provider was in the small percentage that didn't carry UPN, so it was rather depressing at the time. Obviously, when a show premieres, you want to make it memorable, but this show did not let up, let up off the gas at all. I watched it on the network, so it made for even less time to breathe without the commercials. It was fun to see how many big angles that were memorable for the right and wrong reasons starting on this show. The first seeds were planted for the Rock and Sock connection in the opening promo. Big Boss Man and Al Snow setting up the epic Kennel from Hell continued to be set up on this show. And who can never forget the continuation of Tess's big push that ended in Triple H getting the spotlight after the failed wedding. I remember he was really over with the fans after that SummerSlam match, but it seemed like they just lost faith in him. I suppose there were only so many times you can beat up the Mean Street Posse before it just gets old. Correct me if I'm wrong, but was this the episode where Jericho was in the doghouse instantly, no pun intended, for hurting Road Dog with the power bomb through the table? I seem to remember him hurting somebody right away when he came to WWE, but I could be way off. I think that story actually involved China and hurting her in a match, not Road Dog, I think. Overall, I give this a 7 out of 10. It was a really fun show, but the Boss Man stuff mixed with the awful evening gown segment knocked this down a few points. Now, see, I didn't see the evening gown segment, and they definitely did plug that during the show, I remember now, in commentary, hmm. which that was not on the YouTube version I watched, uh, and maybe it was on the network, so right. we missed out on the evening gown match. Shit. Fuck. Derek from Denton. Man, this show dragged for me, guys, and I was actually excited to go back and watch this episode of SmackDown 2. The opening segment was goddamn boring. It seemed like the only one with any energy at all was Mankind. Everybody else was just going through the motions. I was excited about the tag team title match until I saw it, since it was pretty much just a clusterfuck of moves. Uh, I did like how Undertaker was very respectful to JR and King before he slapped the shit out of Big Show. The main event was fine along with Mankind vs. Shane. I give this show 4 choke slams from Hell out of 10. And finally from Mike B, I was at this SmackDown. I made the road trip from Winnipeg to Minneapolis for SummerSlam, then to Iowa for Raw and Kansas City for SmackDown. We were row four facing the hard camera, if you care. I'm the guy marking out, jumping up and down like an idiot when HVK laid out the rock. We were with the Wade Keller Lies sign guy, and we were all huge HBK fans. I remember that hot ending to the show and can't really remember the follow-up to the angle. Well, there really was none. I think this was around the time that HBK was not doing so well in his personal life and had some issues to work out. Seeing Jericho debut at the time gave me a little pride for the hometown boy. I was also holding up a Remember Owen sign early on and having a WWF suit come and talk to me and ask me to show it sparingly. Oh, wow. Wow, they didn't confiscate it. Yeah, that's nice. It was the first time WWF was in the Kemper Arena since Owen's tragic death in that building. I almost half expected them to take it away from me. I just want to pay tribute to one of my favorite wrestlers, but I decided not to hold it up after that. I also remember almost getting run over by Edge and Al Snow as they spilled into the crowd. I think he means Boss Man and Al Snow. Um, the overall feeling of this show was so exciting in person and we felt like we were part of something special. WWF was really hot at the time and SmackDown felt almost like a pay-per-view that night, but watching it back, that's likely more due to my great seats. Still have no idea how we managed those. How horribly great were the Mean Street Posse? Also, I met Jimmy Miranda on this trip when they were cleaning up the merchandise stands. He was such a nice guy and willing to talk to fans who cared. I also heard of the wrestlers saying nothing but great things about Jimmy and I could see why. Just a genuine nice person. Six out of 10 peak gases for the show and nine out of 10 for the memories from that road trip well that was great feedback there from someone firsthand yeah and and i mean some a pretty clear recounting of events from you know 15 years ago just have one of those memories yeah all right well thank you folks for your feedback uh, to this particular edition of smackdown